We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Alexander Klimberg. Welcome to today's uh, session. I'm a director at the Hague Center for Strategic Studies, uh, and I had the privilege of serving as a director of the Global Commission on the Stability of Cyberspace. I was a multi-stakeholder initiative encompassing 29 leading cyber experts from 16 countries, including former ministers, heads of security services, but also thought leaders from the technical community, civil society, academia, and business. Our final report, Advancing Cyber Stability, was launched November 2019 at the Paris Peace Forum by the uh, French and Dutch foreign ministers, and has gone on to have, as one academic observer noted, a significant and measured impact on the international discourse, primarily in the UN First Committee processes. The impact uh, included also helping define the term cyber stability, also presenting something called the cyber stability framework, but most visibly it's been our eight norms of responsible state and non-state behavior in cyberspace. One of these norms is a norm of non-interference in the public core of the global internet and has been the most successful. It has featured virtually in every pre-draft of a major international cyber diplomatic discussions in the last couple of years. Um, and we sometimes uh, heard it being one of the most discussed terms and most discussed norms of them at all. Um, today, we will drill down a little bit on the public core um, term, as well as see where we are in the discussion around it. Uh, we have three commissioners from the Global Commission to help explain the public core, and then four outside experts to help share some comments before kicking off into what we hope to be a group discussion. So if you have some questions or points that you would like to raise, please use the friendly chat box, the chat function, um, and I will pick those, um, either pick those issues out directly or call upon you to make your points. Um, with that, I'd like to first turn to our three briefers. We will first, um, they need no introduction, but I will introduce them anyway. Uh, first, we have Olaf Kolkman. He's the principal of Internet Technology Policy and Advocacy at the Internet Society. He is also a board member of the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise. Uh, next, we will have Henriette Esterhusen, who is chair of the Multi-Stakeholder Advisory Group of the IGF. Uh, previously, she was executive director of the Association for Progressive Communication. And then we'll have Wolfgang Kleinwächter, Professor Emeritus from the University of of our hosts and a former ICANN board member and a leading academic on the subject of internet governance. With that, I'd like to turn to Olaf, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, this is a small introduction to, uh, to, the, to, to the public core norm that the Global uh, uh, Commission developed. Uh, I'll be sharing this pleasure with, uh, with other uh, uh, commissioners. Um, so let me start a little bit with uh, 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 looking at, at attacks on the internet. Um, they happen, uh, and they happen with some regularity, if I may say. Um, there are some um, um, uh, examples that, that we've listed here of attacks that really take a, a, a benefit or use the internet infrastructure as a stepping stone for uh, for further attacks, um, DNS espionage. Um, uh, this was a attack where um, the DNS was used to change uh, um, uh, 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 the, the 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 entries so that uh, men in the middle attacks could successfully be be taken. Um, uh, uh, advanced persistent threat actor uh, that that undertook this work. Uh, they used the DNS and then changed uh, for uh, were able to get uh, uh, secure credentials um, uh, to validate web resources. Uh, another attack, NetNode, um, 
sort of a man in the middle attack uh, where uh, infrastructure of NetNote, NetNote is a is a is a, a provider of DNS services, a registrar, and their registrar business was uh, was was attacked in order to change uh, pointers in the DNS, which then were used as a stepping stone for further attacks against uh, third parties. Uh, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, Apple uh, targeted through an accidental BGP errors. BGP errors happen all the time, uh, misconfigurations. Um, but some of these are uh, suspected to be uh, of uh, malicious sort, sor source. That's that's not always easy to prove. Um, uh, but in this case, uh, this example, uh, there are strong suspicions. And then um, um, something that we've seen uh, a couple of times, for instance, in October in 2016, uh, uh, massive DDoS effects on the uh, 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 attacks on the DNS, uh, where multiple devices are uh, sending uh, DNS queries, um, and and the DNS is sort of used as a as an amplifier of traffic, and then uh, uh, takes out uh, a subject. Uh, a third, uh, uh, not a third example, uh, a fifth example is uh, is cable cuttings. Uh, cables make up the infrastructure, uh, the life support, so to speak, of the global internet. Um, there are cables uh, uh, across the oceans, and sometimes they are cut. Uh, an accidental anchor. Uh, again, this is where uh, uh, accidents and maliciousness. Uh, um, uh, 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 happens. Now, if states uh, and non-state actors uh, do this, they, they, they hurt the availability of the internet. They hurt the availability of the network of networks and all the infrastructure that is needed, physical and logical, to connect us all together. And that's an issue. So that is why um, uh, the GC GCSC, the Global Commission for the Stability of Cyber States, uh, defined a, a norm, uh, a proposed norm, um, which is about the protection of the public core of the internet. And it reads, state and non-state actors should neither conduct nor knowingly allow activity that intentionally and substantially damages the general availability or integrity of the public core of the internet, and therefore the stability of cyberspace. In the report, in our uh, final report, we are uh, defining uh, what that is, what the public uh, core of the internet is. Um, and the public core includes packet, uh, packet routing and forwarding. Um, and that in itself includes, uh, for instance, uh, uh, physical and logical infrastructure, routers, switches, and, and those type of things, but also the configuration and the standards uh, that make up uh, uh, these infrastructures. So also the logical um, infrastructure. The naming and numbering systems, um, think of the DNS, but also uh, uh, the infrastructure um, uh, of the IRRs that hand out the ad addresses and, the, and their backend systems. Um, and for instance, the PKI system that, that secures that. Um, and talking about PKI systems, cryptographic mechanisms of security and identity. Um, so the web PKI, the things that, uh, the, the infrastructure that makes sure that you can validate uh, uh, a site that uh, starts with HTTPS, so to speak. And then finally, uh, the physical transmission media, such as um, uh, uh, transatlantic cables. Um, if you close read the proposed norm, you see that it is a call on state and non-state actors, and that it has a, a, a language that precisely talks about um, proportionality and such. Um, so that it is a norm that can actually be adopted by states um, uh, uh, um, and, and still allows them to, uh, uh, 
to take out uh, to, to 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 take limited uh, uh, to take take limited defensive actions. Um, so with that introduction, I would like to hand over Alex to who? Thank you. Esther. Yeah, no, thanks. Um, next is uh, Anrit Esterhusen, um, how the norm has been received so far and how it connects to issues such as the Global Digital Compact. Um, Anrit? Um, thanks, Alex, and welcome to everyone who's here in the room. It Actually, the numbers are increasing as people walk in and to everyone who's online. Um, I'm here in Katowice. Um, I think that the 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 the, the, the careful background um, work that was done in developing this norm is reflected in the fact that it has received significant support. Um, uh, if you look at this map, you'll see that the support is reflected. Firstly, the green countries, those reflect um, support for the norm via the Paris call. The Paris call, um, I think, first uh, was in 2018. Um, in Paris, where a group of states and other non-state actors came together to talk about internet governance and a stable and secure internet. And this uh, document expresses and includes support for the, the norm on the uh, protection of the public core. The yellow countries are um, countries that are still discussing it and that are still considering how they, they stand with regard to the norm. And in red, there's um, a, a country that's indicated that still that actively doesn't support um, the norm. But aside from these national level um, uh, uh, support, there's been significant uptake of the norm um, in various multi-stakeholder and also in intergovernmental discussions. And I think as it is on this slide, you see the quote there at the bottom, we should all be determined to protect the core of the internet as a global public good. And I think the, the sentiment um, reflected there in Chancellor Merkel's or ex-Chancellor Merkel's um, remark links us to the current discussion we're having about the potential of a um, global digital compact that has been mentioned in the UN Secretary General's document, uh, Our Common Agenda. And I think why that is so significant, and I think why the public core norm is so significant, is that as internet governance diversifies and is increasingly di distributed on the one hand and specialized with specialized institutions from cybersecurity sector to intellectual property, um, to, to market regulation, um, as, as the processes of internet policy and regulation and the institutions that deal with them um, become more diversified, the more important it is to have some common principles that can underpin this, this growing ecosystem of internet-related policy and regulation. And I think that's historically why this norm is so important. And I think if it can take us closer to this recognition that Chancellor Merkel states here on uh, the core of the internet as a global public good, I think the more solid will be the foundation um, for, for internet governance. Back to you, Alex. Thank you, Henriette. Uh, next, I'd like to invite Wolfgang Kleinwächter to comment a little bit on what is and what is not the correct interpretation of a public core norm. Um, we've seen it in circulation. It has a rather good uptake. Um, and now we come to the exciting topic of interpreting the public core norm. So over to you, Wolfgang. Okay, thank you, Alex. And uh, it's really a pity that we are unable to meet in person in Poland and hope that the next IGF will give us an opportunity because the issue will remain on the table for the coming years. And, um, you know, what I see uh, after two years of discussion of the public call, uh, public call uh, norm, uh, there are two issues, you know, which needs probably a further clarification. One is really uh, the understanding what is mean by the norm. Uh, that's the interpretation question. And the other question is what to do. Uh, uh, Olaf uh, has uh, outlined, you know, the various attacks against the public core. And so the question is what to do, how to react to these uh, threats. You know, as far as the interpretation is concerned. So I think it's important to uh, remember the discussion in the last 15 years about the whole uh, internet governance ecosystem. 
where uh, the Tunis agenda, which was the founding document uh, also for the uh, multi-stakeholder approach, differentiated between the development and the use of the internet. I think this is really an, a very important uh, differentiation uh, because you know the development of the internet, these are more the technical aspects uh, where you deal with the resources and the public core of the internet, as uh, Olaf has said, you know, includes all this domain name system, IP address system, routing system, and all this, you know, this is the core of the internet, which is related to the technical functioning of the internet, and which uh, Göran Marby, the, the CEO of ICANN now, has uh, coined as the technical internet governance. The use of the internet, this is more the public policy issues, and this creates the majority of the problems also discussed in the IGF. These are issues like general cybersecurity, uh, digital economy, human rights, and, and, and other issues. And, while, and we, the, the both layers are interlinked, but these are separate issues. And, uh, I often compare the um, uh, core of the internet, that means the technical uh, neutral resources like the air. So that means uh, this can be, this is a neutral resource, can be used by everybody. And uh, if you open uh, the window, then air comes in. There is no Chinese air or Russian air or American air or European air. So the air is for everybody. And this is also uh, uh, with the public core of the internet, the domain name system, the IP address system. These are neutral resources, which you know keeps the whole system functioning. And I think this is really important uh, to stress uh, that uh, the um, one of the risks next to the criminal attacks against the public force is if you politicize, let's say, this uh, neutral resources, then you add an additional threat to the functioning of the internet. There was a debate in the business process that, uh, uh, you know, uh, whether the responsibility should go uh, to the management of these resources to ICANN and, and to the technical community. Um, I think over the years, the technical community, which is called now the so-called empowered community after the Yana transition, has demonstrated uh, that the whole system is functioning. And, uh, you know, the pandemic was more or less a stress test, an in, uh, unbelievable stress test for the functioning of the Internet. Because during this time, it became very clear that the Internet is so important, you know, for uh, the uh, national economy, for, for our daily life. And there was no problem getting an email address, uh, getting an IP address number and domain name. So that means the whole system in the background worked. And it worked because it's a distributed system with very clear and shared responsibility among the various partners. So the misunderstanding what I see is that uh, some people say, OK, if there are threats, and this is now to the do question, what to do? If there are threats against the public forum, what should we do? And you know, some governments have the idea we need a governmental oversight. So but this exactly would, uh, would be like a pollution of the air. This would you know, undermine, because if you bring geopolitical conflicts to the management of the technical resources, then you undermine the stability uh, of, the, of, of the system. So that means if governments want to do something, so in my eyes, they have two options. One is they can use the governmental advisory committee in ICANN or the consultations which are established between the IRs and other uh, um, technical internet bodies which they have established with these governments. And the other channel is they can more or less declare that they uh, uh, do not interfere into the day-to-day -day operation uh, of the management of the uh, critical internet resources. So that means it's, uh, the best thing for the stability uh, of the uh, public core of the internet is a non-interference of governments into this and not, you know, to control it or to uh, uh, try to overtake management functions. I think the, uh, for years there was a debate uh, because the US uh, Department of Commerce 
which never interfered into the management, had an oversight role uh, over the, the root server system, at least the, the A root server. So, but with the Yana transition, this argument is gone. Now all governments are equal. So there is no privileged role for one government. And uh, in so far, it would be best, you know, if the governments would be respect the um, uh, functioning of the public war and uh, as they have recognized in a certain degree in the Tunis agenda, that this is in safe hands in the uh, so-called empowered, uh, empowered community. Certainly, you know, if there are criminal attacks, then something has to be done. This has to be first specified. Okay. So it, 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 the whole thing is too important and too risky uh, just to cross the arms. So one has to discuss, you know, what can be done, but it needs a trust into the, um, uh, uh, what people call the, the technical internet governance mechanism that they can react adequately. So I stop here and I'm looking forward to those comments. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Wolfgang. So as um, mentioned, we're going to first turn to some uh, to, to four expert briefers to provide um, outside expert briefers to provide their respective perspectives on the public core before um, turning to the audience um, for a group discussion. But just to follow up on Wolfgang's points, I just wanted to draw attention um, to the chat box where um, I've put a link on uh, statements released by the Global Commission on interpretation of the norm on non-interference in the public core that we issued in September 21, 2021. So that provides a little more additional work expert commentators. Uh, first up is uh, Ingbar Snabil. He's a senior policy Alexander, I think you, Sir, because you broke off. Ministry of So we're having some audio problems with you, Alexander, currently. There's a little bit of a lag, but maybe let's okay. hand it over to Igmar and then maybe you can fix it in the meantime. Yeah, Igmar, Igmar, pl sources. Igmar, please pick up. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can you maybe just confirm whether you can hear me, see me? Uh, yeah? Okay, great. Um, well, first of all, uh, uh, thank you so much uh, uh, for, for inviting me to, to speak on this uh, on this panel. My name is uh, Ingmar Snabili. I uh, uh, work at the uh, Cyber Task Force of the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Netherlands, uh, working mostly on um, the sort of first committee uh, processes, the, the currently the open-ended working group uh, on cyber. Um, and previously I, I worked at the um, uh, UN Office for Disarmament Affairs, where I also supported the two uh, previous negotiation processes uh, on, on international cyber security. Um, and I, it's great that, um, that you're organizing this event at IGF, which I think is a very useful format and also a great way to, to make the link to um, the new open-ended working group uh, that will start uh, its discussions, uh, its substantive discussions next week. Um, so for me, this is also a great opportunity to learn uh, from some of the technical experts and, and follow uh, the discussion. Um, and I, I want to sort of zoom in a little bit um, in, in my intervention, uh, not being a technical um, expert at all about uh, some of the uptake of the norm, uh, particularly in, in the UN context. Um, and uh, uh, Andrietta also already uh, alluded to this. Um, and I'll, I'll zoom in a bit on the, the open-ended working group and how to also take forward uh, uh, the, 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 the public core of the internet and the protection of the public core of the internet in this new process. Um, so maybe just to start with how uh, some of the sort of the, the threats or the, the challenges that we see, I think um, like uh, uh, Olaf mentioned some of the uh, attacks and threats to the public core of the internet. Uh, those I think are, 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 are very uh, of, of a lot of concern, uh, especially as they impact large populations. I think that that is also um, very important to, to note. Um, also the sort of undermining of trust, I think people's trust um, in the internet and the functioning of the internet 
uh, in their use, uh, both privately, but also for organizations, I think is also a crucial element and, and really a reason um, that protection is so important. Um, and this, uh, I think, uh, you know, is also what Wolfgang mentioned, really uh, crucial. This was really tested and really uh, deemed critical and shown as critical during the COVID uh, crisis that, of course, um, we're still in and, and are, are um, resorting to digital technologies and the Internet uh, is, is, is like never before. Um, for us, it also relates uh, to human rights, um, because uh, think about, for example, um, Internet shutdowns or other uh, attacks against um, the availability of the internet uh, can really undermine a right to freedom of expression, a right to freedom of assembly. So we see this as a, as a part of a broader sort of a, a agenda of, of promoting cybersecurity, um, but also really uh, 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 promoting a digital trust and human rights. Um, and another element that we, we see as, as a, 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 a trend uh, that, that I think uh, is important to address is that states are increasingly facing questions around sort of policy and regulation uh, of the internet. And I think Henrietta also has spoke about this and, and, and brought this up um, where of course it's, it's becoming more complex. Uh, the, um, the model for the internet as it was first conceived, of course, is, is now looked at from a perspective that so there, the interests in the internet um, that states have is, is huge. Um, so they, they have that, um, uh, uh, there is a tendency to look at regulation uh, and for us, uh, for the Netherlands, uh, it is really important to uh, preserve uh, the multi-stakeholder uh, model um, uh, that, that, that is used for internet governance currently and that really sort of guarantees that, that free flow of ideas um, and has really been vital to, to socioeconomic progress um, uh, until uh, today. So I think that's, that's really uh, important, um, both this element of threats to the public core, but also looking at broader at, at internet policy, internet governance, um, and how to preserve that, that multi-stakeholder model. So maybe to zoom in on, on, the, on the report. So the, the GGE and the Open Ended Working Group, and um, some of you might be more familiar with this than others, but these were two UN negotiation processes uh, on international cybersecurity. And they both reached uh, a, a consensus and, and came with um, uh, their final reports uh, around this spring, uh, summer this year. And, uh, and they both address the, the public or the internet, be it in different wording. And I, I hear I, I would sort of um, stress that the technical experts often uh, don't like the lack, you know, they don't like the, the definitions or the, 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 the jargon used in some of these reports, but that's really because that's a way a consensus is found and sometimes different wording is used in there. Uh, the public core is really uh, often referred to in, the, in these reports as the um, availability and integrity of the internet or the technical infrastructure essential to the availability of the internet. So when I refer to public core, you usually see it in that kind of wording. So both these reports, the GG and the Open Internet Working Group report, um, recognized uh, 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 the public core in that different wording under threats, um, saying that threats, uh, malicious ICT activity affecting the technical availability or integrity of the internet are a specific concern. I think that's a, that was an important step. Um, the, GGO, the GGE also uh, recognized uh, the uh, public core of the internet under um, uh, critical infrastructure. And there's a norm uh, in the report, uh, it's been adopted before, but on critical infrastructure protection. Um, uh, and that's, uh, so that means that the public core in that sense was not adopted as a separate norm, but it was part, it was um, uh, uh, sort of, it became part of, of another norm and a norm on, on protecting critical infrastructure is key there, but also on the norm that says that states should not conduct or knowingly support ICT activity that intentionally damages or impairs the use and operation of such infrastructure. So I think that is also a very clear uh, 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 protection and, and sort of endorsement of, mm -hmm. of the importance of the public or the internet and the protection thereof. And it's also linked in the GGE report to uh, the functioning uh, of uh, international trade, financial markets, global transport, communications, health, et cetera. So I think that's also an important link. And to supply chain security. Um, where uh, uh, the importance of, of uh, protecting supply chains against harmful hidden functions 
and exploitation of vulnerability in ICT products and, and that may compromise the confidentiality, integrity and availability of systems and networks. So this is not directly a link to the public core, but I also think yeah. it, it is it's quite relevant uh, to that. And um, then finally, in the open-ended working group um, report, uh, it is also stressed that uh, this type of infrastructure, again, referring to this uh, general availability and integrity of the internet, um, is often owned, managed, or operated by the private sector um, uh, and may be shared or networked with another state or operated across different states. So this cross-border element and the multi-stakeholder element are, are things that we uh, that we see as very important yep. and the Netherlands has been very active um, in, in uh, promoting these links and, and fitting um, uh, the public core of the internet in the Thank under you. these sort of appropriate normative framework. Okay, maybe just to uh, say Ingram, something. Thanks. I think we have, I think we're, we have to move on. Okay, yep. All right, but thanks very much. Uh, the Dutch government was early supporter of the public core norm and was uh, very, very important in trying to drive the discussion in the OEWG and GGE. Unfortunately, uh, from some of our perspectives, the term critical information infrastructure, um, it was used in the OEWG instead of the term public core, which has possibly repercussions we can talk about um, next. But the open ended working group itself was a very interesting um, process, um, in, in particular because it included non state actors, at least in a consultative function. And one of those non state actors that was involved was uh, Sheetal Kumar, our next advisor. Sheetal is a senior program lead at the Global Partners Digital and has been following the public core debate from a civil society perspective. Sheetal, um, four minutes, please. Floor is yours. Thanks so much, Alex, and thank you for this opportunity. It's, it's great to be here. I thought I would cover why the public core norm is so important in the digital age. And from um, just speaking from one civil society perspective, what civil society can do to support it, and indeed what it's already doing in many ways. And to begin with, I'd say that the public core, in the way that it's defined, is really at its heart refers to what the internet is to many people, um, whether they're in these discussions or not, and to the characteristics that define it in terms of uh, what makes it, uh, what we use to share information quickly, to share it safely, um, and to, 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 to buy things, to trade things, to, to create things online, and, and to do all of this safely, it's really essential, um, the different elements that are covered uh, under the definition to an open and interoperable internet that we all value so much. And as a human rights defender, we need, as, as Ingmar was saying there, an open and interoperable internet to be able to exercise our rights, uh, to be able to access information, uh, exercise our rights to freedom of expression and privacy among many, many others, indeed all human rights. And you've already mentioned how the, the norm is reflected in many different, uh, different spaces and papers, reports and instruments even, whether it's the OEWG or um, the Paris Pool or, or, or EU legislation. I think what's important about the OEWG report that Ingmar's just discussed is that it's a report that has been adopted by all UN member states. And so in that sense, it's a really key tool, in fact. Um, and I think, you know, really the next step there in, because when you have these references and you have text, is to move forward with, with implementation and monitoring adherence. And that I think is really key. And that's where civil society can play a really important role. Indeed, it's already playing that role. Um, and I'm going to give some examples. So monitoring compliance, um, explaining and raising awareness of the norm and what it means, and the role as well in developing uh, protocols and systems that are referred to in the norm um, in different multi-stakeholder spaces is, is also very important. Um, so I wanted to do just say as an example, because I don't have much time, uh, one aspect of the, of the norm, which is cryptographic mechanisms. And these are under threat around the world. Um, and you can take a look at the news page of the Global Encryption Coalition, which is a coalition of groups that was founded last year to promote and defend encryption wherever it's under threat, just to give you an example of the various threats to cryptographic mechanisms that are, um, that are currently underway. And the coalition has 
done has played there a really important monitoring role following these threats and pushing back against them. Um, publishing research to show the impacts of undermining encryption or cryptographic mechanisms um, on the internet and has done this by engaging with policymakers and, and convening with others. And it's these are really key roles, I think, and they've had really we've had really great successes in the past year in pushing back against some of these threats. Um, and a, you know, as an example, one of our members recently published a paper on how some proposals for uh, the EU's digital identity framework could undermine public um, the, or undermine trust in the global public key infrastructure and in website uh, security and authentication. And I can, I can put some resources in the chat, but I think this is going to my next point and really my, my next final point which is where we need to be able to point to examples of where the public core norm is being undermined or could be undermined and, and make that link there between the norm and the actions that are being undertaken by governments or by other actors. And so that linking between what is on paper um, and where, how, and what it applies to, and what is happening in the real world or out there in, in policy making spaces, um, and in terms of actions that are being taken, I think is really, really important. And there's much more opportunity to do that. Um, and we heard another example from Ingmar as well about shutdowns and how those impact the general availability and integrity of the internet. I think there's a lot more opportunity to dig down into the impact of shutdowns on, on people, um, on the systems, whether it's autonomous systems or others that are impacted when, when shutdowns are, are ordered. There's also the fragmentation at the protocol layer as well, which is a continuing threat um, that we're seeing, and, and we're seeing attempts in standard setting bodies to do that. So I think we need to be referring to these um, and, and linking it to the norm and, and the undermining of the norm. So, Going forward, I think linking actual actions that we're seeing, including by, by governments and other actors to undermining the public or and showing their impact on people uh, is, is really key. And, and that's where civil society has a continued role to play. So I hope that that hasn't gone over my time and, and given us some food for thought. Thanks so much. Thank you, Sheetal. Perfectly on time and very pertinent points. Um, you mentioned, of course, responsibility to protect and safeguard the public court. Actually, uh, that is also something that has been cast into legislation in the EU Cybersecurity Act, um, which is the new mandate of the European Network and Information Security Agency. There's a clear reference um, to the global, to the public core of the open internet. So I'd like to next turn to uh, Marnik Stecker, who is coordinator for the Network Information Security Directive at ANISA for some comments. Marnix. Hi, Alex. I hope you hear and see me well. Thank you for organizing this and, and thanks for inviting us. So we, we're a technical uh, system security agency or network security agency. So, so you know, we, we uh, to speak about uh, the, 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 you know, what, state, what the nation states should and shouldn't do is, is, is a little bit out of our mandate, but I would like to bring a little bit more of a technical view in, into, the, into the discussion. I mean, we would rather see protocols and standards being in place uh, and encryption being used so that uh, it is not up to the goodwill of individual actors to uh, uh, you know to behave but that the, that the protocols and the systems uh, and make sure that the, the that the internet is, is is secure and open um and so just going back a little bit on on the history of 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 legislation in europe so um, I work in, in, in the EU Cybersecurity Agency. We, what we do is we help EU member states with implementing policy. And historically, the focus has been a lot on the telecom providers and the telecom operators. Um, and, and the focus of the telecom uh, regulators has been a lot on the, the, the last mile, so to speak, the access network, uh, much less on, on the core and on, on the internet interconnections. And um, yeah, what we see now is that in, 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 in that area, there's a lot of things that can be improved. Uh, we still see that, that there are issues around uh, um, border gateway protocol routing, uh, interconnection uh, providers, where it's a bit of a gray area. There's not a clear authority to, to, to take care of those things. Um, and then there's the entire area of internet exchange points, uh, content delivery networks, and so on, which historically has not been regulated or supervised by member states or by by national authorities but has been 
kind of uh, you know, bottom-up uh, developed uh, almost uh, industry governance or, or self-governance. Um, now, this has worked really well. Huh? We have not had major outages, uh, major issues. I think uh, 20 years ago, we, we were afraid that there would be viruses and malware that would you know cause major blackouts but but we have to be be honest and see that you know the redundancy and resilience that has been built in into those protocols um you know has really worked really well uh, it also means there's a little bit less control about where traffic goes but uh, traffic finds its way so that that is really really good um so so far i think we can say that the industry has really delivered and has created an internet that is uh, resilient and and global and and connecting and so on and it's great that 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 the internet governance forum works to 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 keep it that way but there are still some issues uh, and so uh, if you look at the core internet the, the the naming issue the domain name system is quite vulnerable uh, a few years ago we had the mirai botnet that exploited uh, issues in the dns uh, protocol it was it was easy to do reflection and amplification attacks it's really hard for especially smaller organizations, also human rights organizations, to to uh, protect themselves from these kind of DDoS uh, attacks. Uh, so I think really that we need to to improve uh, the DNS uh, uh, ecosystem there because there's there's too many ways to exploit it. And on the routing, we continue to see big issues with border gateway protocol implementations. And although some of the bigger players in Europe have been implementing uh, security extensions of BGP. Uh, and and Manares, for example, there are still uh, players that don't, and there are still mistakes. And in just in just a year or two ago, uh, you know, the bulk of the mobile internet traffic in 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 Europe was routed through through China. Um, so these are are serious issues uh, that we need to address. So how do we move forward? Yeah, from a technical perspective, perhaps we need to take uh, an example from uh, the way, for example, the French regulator is trying to speed up the uptake of IPv6. So they have basically had they have a, a name and shame list where they, you know, spell out who is implementing certain protocols and who is not, uh, because otherwise I think, uh, you know, at a high level everything is secure and risk based and whatnot, but in a practical level we also need to see which operators are not implementing certain extensions, uh, you know, which which uh, domain name uh, sorry uh, top level domains do not implement DNSSEC and so on. So perhaps that could be an interesting. Uh, addition to the discussion, like how do we move forward on standards and 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 how can we make that more transparent to uh, to uh, government but also to citizens? And we are with that. Thank you, also... Marnix. Um, uh, I think you highlighted a couple of interesting points. One point in particular that uh, government regulation or into, or involvement in this area could maybe also concentrate on furthering the community's own response mechanisms rather than developing standard laws and regulations. And your example of what uh, what the French ANSI is doing and trying to support IPv6 adoption <clears throat> could be adopted and continued in a number of different areas, um, including, for instance, also in deployment of best common practice, BCP38, and, and other uh, issues that are routinely discussed in internet governance forum um, yeah. by the people who actually create the internet, which isn't usually the industry, which of course owns it, but actually civil society and the technical community, which of course are largely responsible for setting the open standards that we all depend upon, but also doing defense. So with that, I want to turn to our last expert briefer. Uh, Chris Gibson is the executive director of the forum for incident responders and security team, some team sometimes described as the union of certs um, and therefore has a first-hand view of how this issue plays out in his communities. Chris, um, four minutes, please, four is yours. Thank you, Alexander. And again, thank you very much for inviting me. And really, it's a real pleasure to be, to be asked to speak at this and, and to put some points across. Um, as mentioned, I represent FIRST. FIRST is a globally super inclusive. We take no political points. We do not have access to grind. We are often referred to as the firefighters on the internet. So we are interested in fixing problems, not really looking at where they're coming from, but that's very much something that in the longer term we want to get to. So, so when I say stuff, I'm not pointing fingers at anyone. We are just looking at issues that we see on the internet that affect our ability as a, as a group of 99 countries at the moment, hopefully more, trying to re resolve issues together to, to fix them, to make the internet a better place absolutely believe in this norm this is absolutely the right thing to do the, you know we see the internet as a huge public good we see it as something that we want to keep very much open and, and available for everyone 
and we see that public core thing as part of the public trust in the internet. So I think I see four major challenges is, is with, with, with where we're going on this. The nation state capability, building capability to essentially run their own internets, so to speak, is an interesting one where people can divorce their internet from the world and run their own. I, while that in itself I don't see as a challenge, you have to ask, the, you know, what is the intent behind that? And if the intent behind that is to protect themselves, that implies they either, either see a threat or they see a challenge. That is divorcing us from this public core. We're giving, you know, national sovereignty over pieces of the internet that we, we as an organisation, first don't see as the right way forward. So. Often, you know, when someone builds a club, there are people excluded from a club, and that, that's, that's where we see that one as being a very bad thing. We also, second point, we, see, we say the public um, in core, but increasingly this is run by, by private sector, by private entities, or operated by them. Um, in many cases, regions, countries, obviously, you know, they want to build capability, they put that out to a competitive agenda, uh, operation, RFP, people bid for it. You can see that over time, this could end up with a very large amount of the internet being controlled by a very small number of multinational organizations, as people have mentioned already. There are two challenges with that, I think. One is there's limited competition, and competition is what's made the internet really great and really improved it by people bringing new pro products to the table, putting them out there in open source, making them available to everyone. By doing, by building it down to sort of three, you know, however many big corporates running significant chunks, I see that as a challenge. And then there's the distrust potential of that. Let's face it, we know, the, you know, the organisations we're talking about are primarily, you know, enormous American corporations. That's just the way the world is. Does that then lead to distrust across the world with, you know, the internet is being run by people in country A and I'm in country B and I don't like that. So we worry about that. That, that, that we see as a real challenge. It, it, we want to see it as public, we want to see it as open, we want to see it being run by you know, civil society and corporations and governments and everybody in conjunction, not limited down to a smaller number of major organisations. I think the point that governments may think they have a monopoly on using force and so on in the internet is a really good one. Um, they cannot control it. We've seen demonstrably over the last 20 years that they can't control it. So we need to inf improve our ability to do that. But that means, again, working in partnerships. It means working together. It means working globally together rather than regional groupings and or country groupings and or organizational groupings. So that, you know, that's where first comes into this, you know, with this nonprofit, non-government, international, globally inclusive. But we're a very small part on the internet. You know, we're not enough teams. We're not enough people in doing this with us. So we're very keen to help governments understand that. And one of our one of our mission statements is talking about educating, and this is part of the reason we, we, we really appreciate the invitation here, talking to regulators and policymakers about how we can improve some of this. And I think finally, my fourth point, when we talk about the public core being available and, and, and ready for use, that really essentially is saying that the public can trust that it's there, that they can trust that corp, that internet to be you know, whole and, and sane and doing right things and secure. I think sometimes when we see some of the major, major, major massive hacking attacks that we see, the sort of the spray attacks that we see across vast swathes of the internet, that demo, that by there, these have been attributed again, we don't get into attribution. We are really interested in the problems that they cause. The problems they cause, and I refer specifically to something like Hafnium uh, attacks, is that they remove that trust from public from the internet, which enables governments to say we should build our own internet, or we should do more, can have more control over the internet, or we should be the ones that allow people on or off the internet. And we worry about that in a significant way. So some of those huge attacks that really demonstrate to people, they, they get into your email, they, mm -hmm. they destroy your personal trust in the internet that you are using. It's not core internet, but it is destroying users' trust of that. We see that as a really, really, really important thing that I would very much like people to stop doing. That's not an easy thing to say, but, but that's, those, those are not good at all. That's it, Alex, thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, I'd like to turn to, uh wider discussion now. So I have an early hand raised by Amir Mokaberi, um, who's also posted a comment in the chat. I'd first like to give Amir the chance to speak himself. Um, Amir, do you hear us? Uh, hello, can you hear me well? Sure, go ahead, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, hello, everyone, and hello to distinguished panelists. 
Uh, thank you very much for giving me the floor. Uh, my question is that, um, don't you think that a norm on non-interference in the public court is a subset of the state sovereignty and non-intervention in internal affairs of other states? Like, for example, uh, in domestic, social, political, and economic systems of other nations that uh, should be protected and insured in cyber domain and uh, should be addressed in new OEWG process. Okay. Uh, uh, yes, and another uh, issue that I would like to mention here is that uh, I strongly believe that sovereignty of all states should be protected and respected in internet and cyberspace in terms of data infrastructures, data governance, and making legislation and combating cyber efforts and so forth and so on. And not, not only uh, one certain country should have sovereign, we need just an equal sovereignty in cyberspace. Okay. Uh, All right. Uh, excuse Thank me, you, Amir. Thank you. I'd like to, I'd like to, so, to, to move on to the panelists I, so we yes, can have. I, I, almost, I, I almost finished. Uh, we know that public core under ICANN Corporation is not yet really become international. And ICANN is run under U.S. jurisdiction. Uh, uh, and uh, okay, Amir, thank uh, you. I think we yeah. got your point. Uh, yeah, excuse and me. We, this we, is we, we, we have a question to put uh, to the panelists, and I have both yeah. questions that will go to the panelists. So well, thank, thank you. you for your yeah. thank you for your questions. So first, uh, to reply on the question of uh, if the public core not a question of state sovereignty, and a second question that was added on to that was the question of ICANN sovereignty being subordinate to uh, ICANN um, being effectively uh, in US jurisdiction. So uh, Wolfgang, uh, do you wanna first reply? And then I think also Henriette uh, addressed some of that issue in the comment. Wolfgang, please. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, um, Amir, for the, uh, for the question. I think you have really to differentiate between the public policy issues related to the internet and the technical day-to-day -day operation, what I said in my first intervention. So these are two different shoes which are interlinked, but which should not be what which should be uh, not mixed. When you speak about uh, sovereignty, then uh, it's the principle of equal sovereignty as laid down in the uh, Charter of the United Nations, and this is very relevant for the public uh, policy issues related to the internet. So no doubt about it. So, but if it comes to the public core of the internet, then we are, have to deal with something like um, uh, the common heritage of mankind. I compared it with the air. So, and uh, this is not a part, you know, you cannot say this is our sovereign air and, and we control the air when we open the window. So, and this is part of the, what I called in the chat, the, the, the borderless space. It's not the bordered place where uh, uh, governments have national sovereignty and should avoid interfere into the border places of, uh, of, of other uh, governments. So I think this differentiation is really important. And it shows also, you know, that, uh, that we see a growing sensibility or, the, uh, or sensitivity of governments in the uh, new uh, security um, directive, NIST two of the European Commission, there was original the idea, you know, that all uh, uh, servers uh, which are operate on the European territory should be uh, under sovereignty of the uh, uh, of, of, of European governments, and then they realized that the root server system, which is the global system which enables communication, the two of the root servers uh, are in Europe, one in Sweden and one in the Netherlands. And so they started a discussion whether this would lead to duplication or to conflicts. And the, the wisdom now of the European governments was, or at least the discussion is not yet ad adopted, to have an exception clause and to say, you know, this is a part of the management of the global internet uh, community. This works. So if it isn't broken, don't fix it. And uh, we should not pollute this. And uh, the internet is based on a division of labor and a shared responsibility. So that means not everybody has to do everything. So, and, you know, to delegate some functions for the management of the public or 
to the established community, which has demonstrated the last 40 years that it works and it can deliver. Uh, I, I think this is one uh, which is important uh, to recognize. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank excuse, you, Wolfgang. Excuse me. Can uh, can I jump? In? Uh, Amir, sorry. We have others. We have other people who would like to speak too. Um, so, first of all, uh, Henriette, do we have uh, comments from the room from your I'm side or questions no, from your, your point of view? Is there anyone in the room who would like to contribute or ask a question? Uh, I would like to. No, um, so sorry, Ami, let me just respond first to, I think you've had your chance. Um, just, uh, uh, Alex, I mean, I'm not, I think Wolfgang covered the response. I, I think I just want to, based on what I've experienced here at the IGF, stress how important I think this conversation is. Um, uh, earlier this week, we had the UK government uh, do an open forum on their approach and their thoughts about the future of the internet. Later today, we'll have the White House, we'll have Tim Wu, um, fresh from the summit on democracy, talk about their thoughts um, uh, in the US about how governments should or should not approach internet governance. I think there's increased um, concern from states to get involved in, in, in the internet. Some of that comes from a place of control. Some of that comes from a place of enabling innovation and competition. And, but I think we really still do not have a common understanding. And I think that's why the public core norm is such a good starting point for the conversation. But the one thing which I know is not new to those of us in the commission, but it's still an issue is the concept public. We still have to find a way of translating what we mean by public um, and how it's understood in different cultures and different political historical context. Uh, Wolfgang describes it as this borderless space. Um, I think there are some member states of the UN and some, some governments and their industries uh, represented here at the IGF who see public as putting control within national sovereign borders. So I think one of the key tasks that we have to undertake going forward is translating and finding concepts that have more of a universal uh, a meaning and, and acceptance um, so that we don't come constantly against this, this, this wall of these different perceptions of what public means. Sorry, Alex, I departed a little bit, but- Not I at all, actually. I think the that. point about clarifying terms is very important in particular, since the whole idea of considering public core a sub, uh, subordinate to state sovereignty is exactly the point of the public core is that it, it, it's, that it tries to, to circumvent that entire issue. Um, I will mention some of that at closing in my final remarks. Uh, but first, I want to go to uh, next uh, next question comment from Yik Chan Chin, please, Yik. Yes, thank you. And actually, I think there's a debate, you know, between the uh, public good and also the uh, global common. Probably it can also apply here. When we say global common, we mean something like outer space, you know, or high sea, which is beyond the national jurisdiction. So probably in here, public good means uh, similar to the global common. Uh, but uh, the internet itself is not defined as a global, I mean, the internet, whole internet, uh, uh, cyberspace is not defined as a global comment, but it's defined as a public, uh, global public good. But both global public good itself has a national jurisdiction, you know. So, so I think we need to make sure when we talk about public core, which means global common, but uh, what part of the internet belongs to the uh, public core and some part are not. So the, I think there's a main argument, for example, IP, uh, the protocol or DNA uh, domain name probably belongs to the public core and the global common, but some infrastructure may not belong to the global common or public core because the state have a uh, or some infrastructure. And that's my comment, thank you. Uh, thank you, just a final comment from uh, Sivas Prabhanian, please. And then we'll go to one last comment and then before we close. Sivas Subramanian, please, very quickly. Yeah, Siva Subramanian, and uh, uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm a little concerned about uh, the process by which uh, policymakers and uh, business actors get uh, their advice, and uh, 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 it appears to me that uh, the internet and uh, the policymaking process are on different calendars and uh, on uh, different clocks that are not synchronized in the sense that policymaking is still a hierarchical process where uh, the 
advice comes from those who are proximate to government and those who are proximate to government are traditionally the ones okay. who have been proximate and so uh, or governments getting proper advice and what is the community doing to make sure that uh, fair and balanced advice reaches policy makers and business leaders thank you okay all right thank you i think we are unfortunately already out of time i wanted to just mention that the Public core discussion is a continuation of discussion as all of the internet itself. It's a question of to what extent the internet is a global public good or even a global public resource. Under Ulstrom, there's a big difference between what is a global public good and what is a global public resource. Global public resource requires state intervention to manage. Global public good does not necessarily require state intervention. Also because um, the high seas have been mentioned, the global public good um, concept of the public core is the public core effectively is that part of the internet which is a global public good from our point of view from the global commission's point of view and that basically puts the public core in an illegal zone in between somewhere in between the high seas and the number of entities that are sometimes covered by the common heritage of mankind concept of international law that's not the same as internet as the high seas but that includes the deep seabed the antarctica outer space and the moon so this is a wide ranging discussion with implications for, for, uh, for international law as well. Um, I look forward to continuing that discussion with you. And the uh, last slide, please, can we go back to the presentation, the last slide? I'd like to do a shameless also self plug. The Global Commission Stability Cyberspace Secretariat is also just now launching uh, the Cyber Stability Paper Series, New Conditions and Constellations in Cyber. It features 16 authors um, including two of them who spoke today. And I think it provides additional insight into what the definition of cyber stability can include. I think there'll be something there for everyone. Um, I hope you can uh, access it it's for free. And I wish you a good IGF. But first, let join me all, please, in, in thanking the, the panelists and expert commentators with a round of applause. Thank you. Bye bye.